Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 422. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. This week's interview is with Christine McKay. Christine is a worldly entrepreneur, speaker, and the award-winning founder of Salamandra, animation studios that help organizations to convey complex messages using a variety of state-of-the-art technologies. In this discussion with Christine, we look at animation trends and how the techniques have evolved, the variety of options that it allows in crafting stories and messages, how animation can be used to effectively communicate more difficult and complex subjects, including education, sensitive issues, and of course, entertainment. You'll find all the show notes on mintradial.com. Please do consider to drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Christine McKay, how lovely to have you on the show. I, I, I must say, I think this is a first, an expert in animated videos. You're an award-winning founder of the animation studios that's based in an old town I know well, Eton, as well as up north in Dundee. You're an entrepreneur and uh, an international speaker, and you run this company called Salamandra.uk. In your own words, how would you like to describe yourself, Christine? Well, Minta, thank you very much for having me on board today. Um, so we describe ourselves as uh, visual problem solvers. Um, we like to say that we convey complex messages for our clients in B2B primarily um, using animation on any platform. Uh, so if you want it onto a rocket, we can do that too. Um, we work with a whole stack of different businesses, small and large, and we use uh, animation wise, we use uh, 2D, 3D, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, uh, motion graphics, stop motion, and then, of course, we work on branding and design as well. So anything to do with visual um, problems, challenges, what have you, where the people to go to. Uh, we've got an amazing team. They're, they're uh, agile, um, fun, creative, and everything's done in-house. So it's uh, it's huge fun. Although we've got the two um, studios, as you mentioned, Minta, um, we do work collaboratively between the two studios. And now working remotely, we've actually become more productive, believe it or not. Love it's it. Pretty crazy. Well, um, so I want to start with your background a little bit, Christine, um, because uh, I, I would say kindred spirit in terms yes. of completely colossally weird uh, <laughs> and diverse countries you've been brought up, languages that you speak. Tell us a little bit about your journeys thus far in life, Christine. Uh, right. Well, I have to praise it quite a bit. Um, uh, like yourself, I'm sort of uh, multicultural uh, in the sense of my parents. My father was a, a pure Scot, but my mother's side is a complete tutti frutti. Um, everything from uh, Anglo German, Brazilian, uh, Italian, you name it, it's really quite complex. Um, I grew up in Portugal, a beautiful place to grow up and a lovely place to be a child. Uh, I had a French education, uh, finished my schooling in England and then um, university, etc. Um, and then uh, jumped in an old combi with a, my then boyfriend and drove across Africa, zigzagging across the continent, ended up in um, Southern Africa and working very much into sort of nine territories in, in the area. But actually I'd, I'd sort of by then traveled in about, I think it's 35 of the 55 African countries. So quite, quite a bit, but it's beautiful. Um, and I've traveled quite a bit uh, just generally just to have fun. Um, I was even actually in the, I think it was a 1991 carnival in Rio, which is, I was part of the whole thing in the headdress, the boots, the singing the samba down the samba drum, the whole thing. Uh, so um, so I, I, I lived and worked in South Africa for a bunch of years. Then we moved to New Zealand um, and then uh, we then moved back to the UK. So it's been a sort of around the world trip, really. Um, and it's been wonderful because really having to experience different markets, um, you know, the, the, the markets are all very different. Business is done very differently and in exciting ways. And you kind of learn from that. You learn from the different cultures and the different people. I mean, South Africa has got 11 official languages um, and it's marvelous. It's it's so diverse. And and their kind of business is it's a bit like I imagine it must be in America where anything's possible I and mean, people aren't jaded or or sort of cynical. It's um, you have an idea. They go, great. How are we going to do that? You know, whereas I think in Europe, it tends to be more mature market, a little bit more stayed in a way. Um, you know, it's proven its point and it's done really well. But I think maybe new ideas aren't quite so welcome. I don't know. Um, no, but yeah, it speaks to the power of diversity. And when you when you look at in Africa, they sometimes have uh, leaped 
over certain technologies. Plus they have the bootstrapping as a core manner of doing business. And that kind of an attitude lends you to be more innovative and, and, and presumably more efficient as far as making the end cart product less expensive. Absolutely. I've seen some incredible innovation. I remember we uh, broke down um, in uh, Zaire, or we first broke down in Centrafrique uh, in the Combi, um, and then limped along to, to Zaire. It was still Zaire in those days. Um, and we had a real problem because it's an air-cooled um, engine using, I think it's two or three litres of oil. It's very little. And that was where the leak was, and that's why we seized the engine. Anyway, long story short, um, a 14-year-old boy uh, local to, to the area who'd been trained by a, a Belgian engineer, I think, um, came up with a solution. He used, believe it or not, a sardine tin, cut out a, a sort of a washer shape and put it to bung up the um, where it was leaking, where the uh, rubber was leaking and the, the oil. Anyway, long story short, we managed to get to um, sort of the next town and, and get it fixed and what have you. We actually, um, we broke the Guinness Book of Records by being towed uh, the longest tow we got towed through three countries <laughs> which is pretty bonkers but there you go <laughs> nice one um so in in your uh journey you've landed on animated videos yes how did that happen uh, well, I actually, I've always been a very visual person. In fact, uh, my first ever crush as a child was a, a, a cartoon character called Marine Boy that my sister and I used to fight over. Um, he's mine. No, no, no. He's mine. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and uh, so I think that um, I, I'm one of my friends in New Zealand when we lived there, uh, ran an animation firm and I absolutely loved what they did. And when I moved back to the UK, I realized there was a gap in business for animation as a fantastic way to convey those complex messages, be understood in a snap and really get that message across. Um, so that's when I started Salamandra here in the UK and, and focus very much on animation as a form of a very malleable, um, agile way to communicate. And there are so many different ways that um, animation can be used in business or education for that matter, because apparently we, we process images um, 60,000 times faster than text. Uh, it takes us 13 milliseconds to uh, absorb an image. Um, and that, you know, if you're trying to explain something, if you're trying to read something, um, it takes so much longer. And if you have any kind of learning disabilities or reading disabilities, that's much, much a bigger ask. Whereas, whereas you know, um, we're built to, to um, our brain is, a third of our brain is, is built for vision. So, you know, that's kind of a very fast way to get that message embedded and, and understood. Uh, and it stays in your long-term memory, which is even better. Mm. So, your the name Salamandra, of course, it uh, attracted me for a couple of reasons, other than it being odd. It's a different, you know, so it's a combination word. Um, I, I went to a business school whose emblem was a salamander. My college at Yale in 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 uh, United States was the, also had the salamander. So somehow it's been around me. So I felt inclined to talk about the salamander. Tell us about how you came up with your salamander. For those, you can't see this because this is an audio recording, but behind you is your animated salamandra doing its moves, uh, presumably a little bit of the rumba, the samba. The... Anyway, it's very fun. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. He's a, he's a very popular uh, character. He's our, our mascot, Sal, um, obviously short for salamandra, um, and he's a 3D character that we use in lots of different environments. And, and the name came up from an old uh, nickname, actually. Uh, my sister's old nickname, uh, her name's Sandra, and uh, was uh, um, in Portuguese, Sandra is Sandra, and Salamandra in Portuguese is Salamandra. So Sandra Salamandra is very sort of similar. Uh, so that's uh, one of her nicknames, and uh, it's been really popular. People, I mean, I love lizards anyway, any kind of lizard. Um, I think one of my favorites is the one in New Zealand, which is bright green and doesn't have eyelids, so it uses its tongue as a windscreen wiper. And it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. Um, I just think they're very friendly characters and they, they're good for the environment. Um, and I don't know, people just seem to resonate with it. And of course, uh, being a bunch of lizards, we, we call it the lizard lounge. So we're, you know, <laughs> uh, Salamandra has its own lizard lounge. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's having, apparently I've just recently found out that um, having some kind of um, mascot uh, improves the recognition of your business or your brand by 6.7%, which is um, incredible. Or sorry, 6.7 times, I beg your pardon. Right. Uh, so it is actually quite um, a valuable thing to have. We like it because it's very engaging and people comment 
on his personality. We can, we're now building a whole brand Bible around him and his backstory and everything else. So it's, it, it definitely gives you marketing legs. It does. I mean, uh, when you said 6.7%, I was thinking, oh God, that's one of those marketing claims that can't possibly be justified. <laughs> but it, I mean, obviously you, you need to have uh, some sort of impersonization or uh, elements that are coherent with your mascot. Otherwise it's sort of, you know, mascot for mascot's sake. Yes. Absolutely. I think right. um, yeah, so you, you write, you are a lizardly lot of parrot tamers and shark divers, narrow boat natives and dragon keepers. So we're rather flowery language. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's actually all true um, uh, with regards to uh, our team. We all do that. Uh, it's, it's true of um, uh, it's true of uh, what our guys do. So whether they were brought up on a, on a narrow boat um, uh, or what have you, or have tamed parrots or what have you. It's all true. So you mentioned before how a video, you know, there's so many different expressions of it, it says thousands and millions of words, millions of messages that we can capture. Mm -hmm. How would you otherwise describe the, the general rise of video in our lives? I think that we're all time poor and we have a lot to absorb, uh, whether that be for fun or for business or, you know, uh, for learning purposes. Um, and doing something visually, it, it's something that we are instinctively drawn to as that sort of primeval um, part of our brain. Um, and as I say, it does stay in your long-term memory. So it is incredibly useful for getting mess complex messages across. You can use um, animation can be a very, as opposed to film, um, it's got a lot of advantages. One, you can create it completely remotely, which in this particular time is great. Um, and it can be uh, really created by teams all around the world. I mean, our team, uh, do happen to be in the UK, but, but they could actually be anywhere. So you can, um, it can be used for sensitive subjects, um, whether it be talking about, for example, funerals or abuse. Um, it can be used for, um, uh, it can be genderless and culturalless. It's um, it's a, a great way to, you, you can convey something quite complex in an abstract way. You can go back in time into the future. You can become, uh, you know, an amoeba. You can go into a piece of um, engineering. Uh, you can, you know, explain, um, demonstrate something in a sort of um, uh, small space environment that you couldn't use film, for example, you can, it, it really is very, very malleable, very uh, diverse. There's lots of different ways of using it, uh, particularly for education and education, be that for commerce or, or, a, you know, tertiary or primary or secondary education. It's, it holds your attention span longer. We've all so used to um, lots of, you know, being bombarded with lots and lots of different information. It's, it's one way of, of keeping you engaged. So for example, we do a lot of um, uh, animated presentations now for business. So instead of, you know, death by PowerPoint, we can actually create, you know, um, slides which uh, animate from one to the other. So it feels like you're watching almost like a film, if you like, it's, it's seamless, but it's clickable. So you can, you go to the next section when you're ready to talk. Uh, again, it just is another way of, of, um, bridging that gap between face-to-face -face, um, or in-person to, you know, long distance or Zoom, what have you. We've also found that um, clients are more and more uh, wanting us to create their uh, 3D virtual auditoriums and, and multi-screens and stuff. The stuff that we used to do in person for overseas or local conferences, we're now doing completely virtually for clients where we'll create the environment to feel that you're actually in this virtual um, auditorium. Uh, and then the actual animations or presentations that go on the multi-screens themselves. The other thing that we've, we've been doing, which is a lot of fun, is we, we can green screen ourselves or our clients and then put them in a completely virtual environment where bonkers things can be happening. You can have, you know, um, you know screens that come down, uh, 3D um, graphs to uh, really complement what you're saying. We've had Sal walking on the virtual stage, uh, stomping across in his little, you know, um, a personality walk and stuff. Um, and, and you literally you can do absolutely anything. Uh, you can create completely virtual environments. You can um, have half and half. You can use augmented reality where you can potentially use, say, a QR code, which you know back in vogue. And then you can create something that comes out at you from the screen or from a printed matter in 3D. You can see it on your tablet or your phone and look all the way around it. You can anchor it to the real world environment, walk around it, see the uh, whatever the animation or the instructional thing unfold. And it's, it's just much more um, 
it just involves you a lot more. And now, um, probably jumping a bit here, but uh, with VR particularly, it's really exciting what can be done from a demonstration purpose. So if you've got, if you've had this massive conference that you wanted to have all these people from around the world attend and now it's not happening, well, why not create it in a virtual um, environment, a completely virtual environment where, you know, for the price of a, a ticket, a flight to London to, Par to Paris or London to, to Cannes, for example, you can send your VIPs a headset with controllers and then invite them to a virtual demonstration where you can have other avatars of your staff, for example, coming to explain how something works, answer questions, blah, blah, blah. They can be salespeople, engineers, you name it. So it brings up a whole new uh, world of possibilities with regards to demonstrations, whether that be uh, pharmaceuticals. We were up for a couple of awards, actually, for um, a campaign we did for a big uh, pharmaceutical UK pharmaceutical that um, had an infant I uh, can't give you too many details because I'm NDA, but an infant disease that um, it was a campaign that started just in the UK. It was using AR, uh, placing a, a sort of a basically a cot in your own environment where the child's um, illness develops. It's quite emotive. It's quite emotional. And the client himself was very moved because he's a parent himself. The child then uh, transitions under sort of a, a time lapse into a hospital environment. And then what happens there? And that was really used to... Um, explain to clinicians without being able to show them or be there personally how something works and how you know these um how you know the pharmaceutical could help um and it was so popular that um, had such a huge effect that it went to europe then it went to hold EMEA, went to australasia became a sort of global thing and we then obviously amended and, and localized the animation to suit each territory um, and just shows how it really can be used for any industry. Um, it can be used for education, particularly. Um, I think it's it's a fantastic tool, whether that's internal for you know health and safety and HR for business, or for uh, primary, secondary, tertiary education. What better way, especially now if you are having to learn remotely, to engage um, and immerse people in, in in learning in a way that, especially young people, that they, they're all on on YouTube normally. Uh, and they learn stuff from YouTube. It's it's a so the new way of learning. So why not incorporate that into your actual courseware um, in a way that that's um, you know more immersive. Right. Well, you've said a lot of things there, and uh, I want to just unpack a couple. I want to start with the notion of sensitive material, mm -hmm. and uh, for having done a film myself, so uh, I'm I kind of feel like I'm aware of the the power of video and the immediacy of the pathos that can be mm. brought around and also the the challenge with actors you know hey you should act sad you know or you should act with a uh, pathos um it it's a complicated thing for actors to get across especially if they're not professional in a documentary format or a business person you're trying to have them do a speech uh, that's supposed to be with gravitas, but doesn't necessarily come. So when you're doing these animations, how do you approach sensitive topics? What, what is it that allows for animation to come across? Do you need to have a little bit of lightness, humor in, in, a, in a medium which can quickly lead to too much at some level? Well, like, like any kind of film, uh, our animations do have story arcs, um, even though they might be, you know, say business orientated, for example, although we do, we're getting asked more and more to do more entertainment and children's stuff. But so that story arc will help with, um, you know, uh, where there's a, a sort of rush of emotion or there's a, a lightness or heaviness, or what have you. But it all starts really with, with the, the briefing. We get to, um, the first thing we ask a client is, what is your challenge and what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to speak to? Why? And what do you want them to do? What's their call to action, really? And once we understand that, we can um, start on the script. And the script may not have a voiceover. It might just be the actual storyline. Most of the time we do use voiceovers, and, and that helps with the emotion, if you like. Um, and voiceover artists are actors, uh, and they know exactly how to inflex and how to get that pathos or how to get the lightness. And, and that, that timing and the cadence is is crucial. So um, animation is one thing, so the visual is one thing, but the sound and everything that goes with it, whether it be the voiceover, the music, um, whether it's sound effects, um, etc., cetera, are, are equally important. And the two together is what makes such a powerful package. Uh, what we, for us, first prize is if we're able to compose a piece 
for um, our animations. It's not always possible. It's usually down to budget. Um, if, if we can't compose a piece, and the reason we prefer that is that we can really work to the cadence and, and ensure that it works with that emotional thing. And it could be sort of an epic feeling or a sad feeling or, you know, just a sort of, a, you know, having a long feeling. But we can achieve that. And we do very, very frequently with um, royalty free music that we go and, and search for and find something that's appropriate. And then we animate to it. So just to show you how the sound is so important, we have to have the voiceover and the music nailed at the same time as the actual um, uh, script and the, uh, the storyboard so that the two things marry. So we animate to the sound to make sure that the two things marry up. And, and there is wow. that sort of story arc, if you like. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it, is, it is important um, to do that accurately sound is 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 very important and you're right in the sense that often you know uh, uh, business owners or, or or people ask whether they can be part of um uh the, the voiceover or the acting and we uh, if it's you know um really something they want then we'll go with it we'll push back we'll say look you guys aren't actors you might come across as wooden why don't we use a, a pro professional voiceover to have that? Plus they do it much faster as well. They'll do it in one or two takes. Whereas when you do it with people who aren't professional, it might take quite a few takes. Yeah, with the challenge of course is gonna be saying it without uh, ruffling feathers, you know. Because, of course. You know, I'm brilliant. Um, yeah, so uh, with, with regard to animation, you, you mentioned uh, AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. What would you say are the trends that are happening? I mean, let's say just broadly speaking, what about animation as a subset of video? Is it a growing part? I mean, video is growing so fast. Is an animation a growing segment within video or growing along with video or growing less fast than video in general? I would say it's it's faster. I mean, there's so many applications to animations, whether that be gaming, which is absolutely colossal, as you know. Of course. Um, whether it's... Uh, you know, for business purposes, whether it's for entertainment, whether it's for education, uh, all those things. The great thing about animation is unlike a film shoot, where if you want to make changes down the line or you want to add on to it, you've got to get the whole film shoot back, the same, you know, weather, you know, uh, parameters, the same environment, etc. With an animation, you can change it uh, five years down the line, 10 years down the line. Um, it really doesn't matter. I mean, obviously the technology will have changed by then because it's changing very swiftly and getting better and better. But the, the point is that it's a much more cost-effective way to, if you're likely to want to change something, to do it via animation. It's also one thing that we've really noticed is, you know, our brains are wired when we see a photograph or a film of a person to make instant judgments. We instantly have a backstory to that person. Um, you know, we judge them on, I don't know, everything, what they wear, their class, their background, their accent, etc. Whereas with an animation, our brain isn't wired to do that. So it becomes much more neutral and you'll get much more buy-in. So people start listening to the message rather than focusing on the person. And that I think is much more powerful than, you know, you could have, for example, David Attenborough, um, uh, let's take some very, very famous and, and people will immediately think, oh, he's such a great guy. But, but you'd be thinking about him and you're not really thinking about what he's saying or you'll get distracted, put it that way. Whereas if it was a, you know, an animation of, of a person who may look like him or even might sound like him, it's not him. So you're not thinking, oh, you know, he's such a good dude and he's a national treasure, blah, blah, blah. You're thinking about what is that character saying and what, what are they trying to get across? So it's very powerful from that perspective. Um, we are born with these instinctive uh, sort of um, knee-jerk reactions and uh, you, you know we can't help it it's just the way we're built so I think animation can really help with that plus in it, you don't have to use humans you can use shapes or abstract form or just um, or even just use um, motion graphics and, and actually lettering that's animated to reflect what you're saying so there are lots of different ways where you can really uh, drill that message down really sort of get the person's imagination and that message across, whatever that may be. When you mentioned Attenborough, I was thinking of his voice and he has such a lovely voice. I, I feel like that's a reusable voice that has, it brings with it some gravitas. It doesn't necessarily throw me into his personality per se. Whereas when you take music that has been used before, that's like me too, or, you know, that you can use royalty fee music that others have used, you know, like, oh no, not that jingle again. 
<laughs> and then and then uh, having some unicity to the music is interesting. In feature length film, typically, as I understand it, film is the last thing you layer on the composer if it's done originally. It's it's taking it, looking at the whole thing, and and adapting to what's going on on the screen in order to to make the the beat match what's happened in the filming. Whereas, as you were saying, it happens coincidentally with the making of because it's really a symbiotic relationship mm. in the creative process. Mm. Yeah, I think it's very collaborative because um, I guess with a with a, a composition, you sort of get a flavor of what it might sound like. But to to have that whole story arc, it's really important to, you know, because the the, the storyboard is something which is, you know, it's a work in progress until the client signs it off. So, um, you know, the, the, com the composer might be playing around with sort of different cadences and stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, they will have the building blocks to to create the, the, the final piece. But there is a little bit of back and forth to get it right. Um, mm. And also, once you get it right, you know, depending on the client, there may be, you know, a number of sort of uh, sign offs within the company. Um, and you may the idea is not to get to that point. We get um, client sign off all along the way. But um, you never know. Sometimes there's always a spanner in the works where somebody doesn't like a particular part of the music or what have you. It doesn't often happen, but yeah, it's it is a collaborative process, and I think it's an organic one. I think it needs to be because you you're really getting across um, a whole story. Yeah, and so that that creative input is always complicated when you have an executive that says, "Well, I don't like that music." I mean, what don't you like about it? Every other note. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to use a, um, a reference to Amadeus. Um, when, you, when you have this sort of extraordinary vastness of possibilities, I, I feel like it's a little bit daunting. You, you, you talk about you can basically do anything. Uh, for an executive, it, you know, it's almost like that's just even more complexity. As it is, I usually don't have the ability to simplify my message and we can do anything. It feels like a, an endless opportunity, a field of dreams for a creative. Um, so talk us through how do you move from complexity to simplicity? Well, um, it's we've got very uh, robust systems. We've got a very robust briefing process where we ask lots and lots of questions. We uh, look at the brand, um, what, what the product or service is. We look at competition, the industry. Um, we, as I say, ask lots of questions. We have to totally understand if it's a, a b2b uh, animation for example have to totally understand what the the product or the, the brand does before we can even begin on a narrative um, then once we kind of understood that and we've um, nailed down the we ask clients to give us say bullet points of what they would like included in the script uh, but but we then finesse that into a script because we know how um how much how many words for example 60 second animation you're playing with about 50 to 90 words, it's not very much, but we're really good at distilling that into something that works. But then that's accompanied by the voiceover, motion graphics, what's going on in the animation, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more richness involved in that. Um, we then also, uh, once we've done our research, we create what we call a mood board and we get a whole stack of different styles um, and color schemes and fonts and everything else. We present that to the client and then they let us know, oh, we love that, love that color scheme, love that style, don't like so much that, uh, we'd love to marry this with that, et cetera. And then, then we start to see what's in their head. Um, and then we can start with, you know, the style sheet and what it might look like. Um, the script helps with the storyboard, um, the voiceover, we can, we can recommend, you know, male, female, child, um, uh, receive pronunciation, uh, regional accent, any language you want under the sun, what have you. And that's another thing. Animation is great if you're international because you can change the, the voiceover to any language. Um, and then when, once that's all signed off, the, the, the trickiest part um, obviously is that there's quite a bit of work that goes into the storyboard because we've got to work out how to visually represent what we're saying and then how to transition from one element to another from an animation perspective. And that, that, is, that takes a lot of skill. Um, because not only are you trying to get across the message, but you've got to do it visually and you've got to do it um, in an a appealing visual way that, that makes sense uh, and that goes with the, the story or the narrative that you're trying to get across. So once, once that's approved, um, then we only then do we start creating the assets. That's the actual drawing of the elements. Um, they get prepared for whatever type of animation we're going for, with, whether it's 2D, 3D, a mixture of the two, whether it's going to go on to AR or VR, you know, we know all that upfront, that's all been, um, you know, 
uh, agreed up front. And then, and only then do we start the animation. Uh, and again, we will send little snippets to clients. If it's quite a complicated piece, we will do what we call an animatic. And that we don't normally share with a client because it, it's a complete pastiche and it looks, well, from an outsider's perspective, it looks absolutely awful. I remember sending uh, a, a, an animatic to a client in the past and they went, oh my God, this isn't what I asked for. This is just hideous. And all it is, is basically using the storyboard, which looks a bit like a cartoon, and then animating it very slightly with, you know, hand-drawn bits to show where it's uh, where the things are happening with the voiceover or the music so that you can see how it will work in a very um, sort of jaggedy way, if you like. There's no animation, proper animation per se, but then it helps with the flow to see that it all works and that the timing's correct. Otherwise, you get animators who might spend too long on a piece that is a lot shorter or too short an animation for something that's longer. It all depends on what the voiceover is doing and the music, et cetera, et cetera. So that's usually only used internally. Um, that's an animatic. And then once we've got the animatic, it, then it really helps to shape where to animate and how and, and what elements to, to put in, et cetera. Yeah, I have had that experience when I worked at L'Oreal where agencies would come in with, hey, listen, what I'm about to show you isn't the final product. It's just a concept board. It's an abstraction of what we want to do. And, and just people just get so tied up on, well, wait, that blue is not right. Yeah, I... <laughs> It's we want a blue, not necessarily that yeah. blue. Yeah. And and we get uh, tied up in it. You mentioned languages. And of course, being a linguist like myself, you will surely know that um, some languages take longer to write than others. And so in the brief, presumably, it's important to know that because if you need to expand into uh, languages that are a little bit more long winded, then you need to make sure that the animation mouth speaks at a time space that will fit for French. Exactly. I mean, they may not have a mouth, uh, you know, we can synchronize it the, 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 and we can change that for every language. So we can actually change out the, the mouth area if you want it synchronized to the speech. We had that recently, actually. We had a, a job uh, with a client in Hong Kong and they were, they were creating something for uh, Japan. And uh, Japanese is obviously a lot longer than than English, um, and the voiceover timing was was quite different. So, but you're absolutely right. And, and even for written campaigns, if you're doing any kind of campaign into, say, for example, EMEA, um, Russian is a lot longer than, say, English um, or even uh, Spanish, and, and Portuguese is a lot longer than Spanish. So it's kind of you have to. You're quite right. You need to know upfront and then work accordingly. So. Say, for example, you've got a voiceover for something that's going to go into Russian, do the Russian one first, that's going to be the longest, and then work back to the English. <laughs> that's funny. And of course, when you write, uh, whether it's characters, then if you're writing in Chinese, there's much shorter than uh, the more flowery German or whatever. That's, that's most interesting. So in terms of technologies, um, first of all, when it comes to the animations per se, I'm wondering to what extent artificial intelligence is now being used. You, you, you've seen how, you, well, in Disneyland, the old Disney, in the old days by hand, each uh, calc led to one movement to another. And then afterwards they started a, a benefiting from a base animation and then using it for other animations, but it, it was still very manual. Today, when someone's imagining the movement of a character, is is there are we at the stage where we can sort of say oh uh, walk with a funny gait to the right a uh, kind of thing and the the animation is then or the ai or some kind of automation allows for that or does that all happen by hand or give us a little bit of an understanding no, of how that happens you're quite right i mean the old days it was all hand drawn and if you wanted any changes you literally had to redraw everything now uh, 2d animations are done uh, in vector uh, animation so it's uh, it's something that you can amend and that's why um you know it it is cost effective to do it in animation uh, because you can amend it uh, we still get asked to do hand drawn animation we we have done it we've been award winning in in a couple of the things that we've done um and it does look beautiful it just takes longer and also if there are any changes uh, that could be quite costly so we we veer get or if we do if clients really want it we'll say absolutely we can do it but these are the criteria you know you got to make sure that you know, there's sort of a buffer zone for that. Um, but with regards to other types of animation, it, it, it's um, the software nowadays is fantastic. And we are now, on, well, we use a number of different uh, platforms and they all do very different things. So um, the platforms use 
physics, for example, to uh, work out if you're doing a drop or a teardrop or or a piece of honey or um, a drop of honey, for example, landing. It uses physics to work out how the movement should should work. So it, it, it's actually quite technical these days, and you can program quite a lot in. Um, for example, Sal at the back here, who's doing his little samba. Um, a lot of what he does has been programmed in and it's although he's completely rigged and he's been built in 3D and so that all the movements can work and his eyes work and, and blink and everything else and he breathes, uh, the movements are done in on a, on a platform that allow us to do it um, more easily, should we say, than having to draw every, every little piece. The other thing which is really exciting, and we absolutely love this, we can't wait to do more and more of it, is that there, we've, we're working on platforms now that we can create animations where you can decide the outcome. So a little bit like the uh, Black Mirror, the Bandersnatch, um, Bandersnatch uh, episode where you could, you could pick the different outcomes and you could have different endings. Well, you can do that now in animation and you can, for example, let's take um, a, a children's episode. Um, you can, at the touch of a button, change the language, change uh, the characters, change the season, uh, change the outcome, um, and it's all in real time. So that's really, really exciting. And we're, we, we get such a kick out of all the developments because, you know, I think lockdowns just made everything come in bubbling up to the surface. I mean, uh, software uh, companies and hardware companies are falling over themselves to, to make the, the, um, the platforms more user-friendly, more versatile, more affordable, um, you know, even sort of all, all the tech like the headsets and everything else, they're much more affordable than they used to be. Um, and, you know, HoloLens and all that kind of stuff that's just getting better and better and better. And it's very, very exciting because it'll help us in all sorts of things. I mean, they're already using those kind of um, uh, platforms for, for example, Boeing uh, engineers are using that to have hands-free voice activated uh, instructions on how to change all the wiring in their planes and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It's already happening. So, and that's using, you know, projected um, animation onto a real world uh, while they're, they, they're making their changes, etc. So um, there's, for example, um, you know, virtual, um, uh, what do they call those um, escape rooms that you can do now, which again, are sort of uh, completely technical, they, they're using the, the new platforms. And, and, and again, it's in real time. So lots and lots of exciting stuff going on. Uh, I can't tell you where it's super excited about it. Well, yeah, that comes through, Christine. So um, in terms of the innovation, I'm wondering where that's happening most. You mentioned gaming. Uh, I can imagine the Toy Story version 16 or whatever going to be coming up in the future. Uh, there's lots going on within the movie industry. Uh, you, you talked about education and, and business in general, using it um, for, for example, training modules. I'm imagining that's a little bit less innovative and more you know, practical. Where is the innovation happening that's really driving the industry? I'd say gaming. Gaming is one of the biggest. Um, uh, it's got a massive amounts of money being poured into it. Um, in fact, um, uh, Dundee, where one of our studios is, they're, they're looking to build an esports stadium there, which is very exciting. And of course, Dundee is the gaming mecca um, of the world, I believe, uh, or one of them. Uh, so uh, gaming is definitely leading the way in lots and lots of different things, whether it be the software that, that um, helps to build the games, because obviously it's, again, it's in real time. It's, it's, um, it's about reducing the size of it so that you can uh, still have a seamless experience uh, while you're uh, taking part in the game, because the, these are massive files. And they, they've, over the years, have sort of made it uh, through technology and improvements, they've made it um, smaller and able to get onto your, um, you know, your hardware, to, to enable you to, to play these things. And again, in real time, and you're playing with people around the world. Um, it's, uh, it, I would say that is the, the biggest front runner. That and probably, you know, um, industries such as pharmaceutical that need uh, to share or even engineering. Engineering is becoming very, very digitized. They're now testing things digitally without having to build them, which is again, is very exciting. So using animation to, to build things digitally, um, it, it speeds everything up. It means that you can prototype things virtually uh, without having to build them anything from cars to machinery to planes or what have you. Um, and uh, it, it means that it comes to market that much faster. It's much cheaper uh, because people aren't having to actually build it, um, you know, in, in bricks and mortar or steel and, you know, metal, it's actually, all digital uh, until 
um, it's gone through all the sort of algorithms and AR test, AI testing, et cetera, before they even build it. So it, it means that all sorts of things are speeded up. Uh, so pharmaceuticals, I imagine there's a lot going on there with uh, uh, testing things digitally, whether it be, you know, vaccines or, um, or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, medical device um, or just, you know, in general, I think it's helping any industry. Um, as I say, we work in over 17 industries from in air traffic control companies to, you know, startup consultancies to, you know, catering, hospitality, engineering, IT. I mean, all those things um, or any industry would, would um, uh, make use of, of kind of a- animation. So I've seen uh, a lot of different VR applications and visualization. And of course, you have the, the training for pilots and all this. The area that's of, uh, of interest to me also is in therapy. As we've been mentioning pharmaceuticals, yes. when, you, when you talk to an individual, there's a human to human relationship, uh, but there is increasingly uh, opportunities to speak to machines. And while some people might think that's an anathema to the human being, there is some evidence that says that we can speak to machines better, especially if they listen more. But when on top of that, the machine is uh, uh, reacting to you in a way that is interesting to you and engages you, I'm just wondering what type of experiences you've seen using animation in therapy. Uh, Well, I've seen it uh, used in training for uh, care, for elderly care, for example, where um, basically you're put in a situation and again, it's it's uh, using VR, but uh, it's interactive. So you have somebody coming up to you who's angry or sad, whatever, and you have to respond to that and and deal with it. And and sort of you get tested on on that, if you like. Um, I've also seen it um, used very well for um, charities where you get more empathy for understanding the uh, environment or the, the, you know, why you're helping a particular charity, what is it doing? And you, you're in situ, you're enveloped in it. Um, I, I saw a very uh, emotional and powerful uh, VR piece on uh, Grenfell Tower, where they did it quite beautifully, actually, where basically you, you had a sort of bird's eye view of the tower, and then you sort of zoomed into one of the, you know, virtual rooms, uh, where you get a couple who are being interviewed about their uh, what their home was like, and as they talk, it gets animated on in in three D. Um, so one one couple had um, you know lots of plants in their home, so these plants are animated on as they're talking, and basically the room um, grows in front of your eyes. Um, and it's an incredibly because you're sitting there and, and you're part of that, you're you're in that environment. It's it's incredibly um, it's very emotional and and very human at the same time. So although I don't have the experience of dealing with an, an actual AI robot, if you like, that you, you're, you're suggesting, I imagine that that could be very useful. For example, if you're wanting to speak to your GP, for example, and, and then, um, you know, a robot might say, well, you know, what are you, what, you know, and again, it, it's, it's quite, it's quite sensitive and it's quite, um, uh, you know, genderless and culturalless and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you might feel more comfortable speaking to, to that, saying what your ailments might be, rather than having to, you know, talk to a receptionist in a, a busy area, um, which is a bit uncomfortable if you've got something that you don't really want everyone else to know about. Um, so I imagine that would be very useful. And you could do that online, just like now, I find very useful that you can phone your GP now and have a phone consultation. Um, how nice would it be to go on, on to your computer, see a humanoid face that says, you know, how can I help you, blah, 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 and, and sort of, you know, direct you traffic wise that way rather than, you know, a recorded message on, on a phone that takes you down this horrible uh, rabbit warren. Yeah, your you call is important yeah. to us. We, <laughs> we thank you for waiting 55 minutes. Uh-huh. We'll be back to you shortly. And then you get call is important to us. Exactly. (laughs) Bloody hell. Um, So last area of chat, Um, as a video producer, uh, I know that um, certainly as a film producer, I uh, respect and use Vimeo for much of my film. What about YouTube? I was wondering what is in Christine's brain? What did she say when I mentioned YouTube? Does she have a positive, mediocre, negative opinion feeling with regard to YouTube uh, in your life? Uh, 
Um, it's YouTube's got lots of service, lots of um, uh, attributes. So, for example, we we've got a YouTube channel, so we have our stuff on there. But we prefer Vimeo from a, a um, sort of branding perspective, in the sense that there aren't adverts, and um, and it's a, li a lot cleaner um, with regards to viewing any of our work. But all our work is now on our website anyway, pretty much I'd say. So you don't really need to go to either. But YouTube's amazing. I mean, my my kiddles um, learn so much stuff off YouTube. And they and they remember it. They spout these facts and figures and 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 you know these methodologies and um, sort of uh, trains of thought. Uh, and I think it's it's fantastic if that if that is the way that young people learn or want to learn or well, I mean, there's obviously lots and lots of vacuous stuff on there too, which unfortunately you get that in, on any platform there, don't you? Um, but there is a lot of good stuff. Um, so I would say that it's horses for courses. So whatever your requirements are they'll be the perfect platform for you. Um, I'd say Vimeo is good for uh, sort of professionally showcasing your films and your animations. Um, YouTube is equally good in a more sort of a bigger, broader uh, sense of um, a bigger audience. Um, but again, it's, it's different. It's a different kind of message you're sending, I think. And also the great thing about um, YouTube is if you have for example, in your email signatures, if you put the URL of your um, animation or film in your email signature, when you send your email, it'll show a little um, thumbprint of that video, which all you have to do is click on it and it goes, takes you directly straight to YouTube. What a marvelous way to have a, you know, a, an advert um, for every, every time that you send your, your emails, uh, you and your staff. So we definitely encourage our clients to do that when we create animations for them. Uh, we encourage them to put that URL and it can be hidden. It can be part of a, an image or something, but if you click on it or, well, you don't have to click on it, but it'll appear as a little um, thumbprint. And I think that's a fantastic tool. Mm, lovely. And um, so in order, I wanted to give uh, people a reason to go check out your website. One of the things that uh, I liked very much was the way you presented your staff uh, with these animated figures, surprise, surprise. Um, and uh, so I, uh, I was wondering how uh, much input each of your employees had. And then you have this animation of them all dancing. And you know, there's this the wonderful sentence, dance like no one's watching you. Whoa, you're on website, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so when you made that web, that animation for your staff, to present your staff with that animation like that, um, tell us about the the process you had with the the inputs of the staff and to what extent those animated figures actually represent the way that they do move and everyone's happy with, you know, the way it comes out. <laughs> sure. So uh, basically uh, when people join us, they, they send us a, um, either, either a photograph or we can take it off um, our Zoom calls and to see what they look like. Um, our animator will ask, you know, what, what jewelry would you like? Um, you know, potentially they might have a watch or rings or something like that they want to, to, to put on there to sort of personalize it. Um, as you'll see from our website, um, you know, we don't all have colossal hands as, as is stylized on, on the uh, the characters, but they all do look like us in one format or another, pretty much. And and the movements, it's, it's just obviously very tongue in cheek, um, but fun. And, and they do actually reflect the personalities, to be fair. Uh, so although people do request, I mean, uh, we've had a, a new starter who requested to do the worm across. Uh, not sure we're going to do that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it does reflect um, uh, the personality. So it is quite a lot of fun. And I think um, everyone enjoys having their avatars uh, and, and having them dancing as well. So, so it's quite a, a fun way to, and we, we change it up quite a lot. Since um, the last few years, we've had different look and feel uh, to, what, you know, whether it's a, an illustration or an animation. And also watch out for what we do to ourselves over Halloween. There's always something funny going on as well. And there's lots of backstories and Easter eggs in, in each of the, uh, the, the GIFs or animations around everybody's uh, Halloween version. <laughs> which is quite Love funny. It. Rendezvous in October. All right. Well, listen, Christine, how can someone uh, get on, find your site, find you, get in touch? What was your best ways? So they can go onto a website, which is uh, salamandra.uk. It's literally www.salamandra.uk. And uh, they can reach me. I'm on LinkedIn, Christine Mackay. Uh, and uh, uh, or they can reach us uh, via email on hello at salamandra.uk. So either of those ways. We're, we're on most platforms as well. You can follow us on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Instagram, Dribble. Um, I'm just trying to think of all the ones, um, all, all the sort of major ones and, and the sort of arty, filmy ones as well. So you should uh, be able to find us hopefully quite easily. Well, lovely. I, I certainly would incite anybody who's doing 
wanting to get it into video, doing video messages has um, budget constraints. The, the fact that you can work from distributed with so many opportunities, especially for international sensitive topics. Wow, there's just a million reasons. Christine, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for bringing your Thank energy you. to the show and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much, Minta. It's been amazing. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why Come on.